So welcome to today's webinar on uh, uh, estate planning. Uh, my name is Josh Antis. I am the Community Partnerships Manager and Financial Education Manager for California Coast Credit Union. I uh, hope everyone's doing well and staying safe out there. Uh, before we get started, just a few things to mention. Uh, we do have everyone placed on mute for the duration of today's presentation. However, if you do have any questions, please feel free to enter them into the question and answer box or the chat box. Uh, we have uh, a few people that I'll introduce in a minute that'll be monitoring both of those so that we can answer your questions for you. Uh, our presenter can also answer questions at, today, at the end of today's presentation as well. And um, we also uh, have some uh, really great tools that I wanna mention before we get started here. Uh, in case you haven't heard, CalCoast has uh, just a wide array of financial wellness resources available to you. And one of them is called Enrich. It's a financial wellness platform that has videos and articles and courses and tools and games and all kinds of things on any number of financially related topics. And it's completely free and available to you. So I will put that into the chat box, the link to go to uh, Enrich and you can check that out anytime. Uh, we also do post all of our webinars, uh, recordings of our webinars on our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you can't stay for the entire presentation today or if you'd like to check out any other presentations we've done in the past uh, we post them all on youtube so be sure to check that out i will also uh, include that link into the chat box so uh, i'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, the team from trust and will uh, we have uh, katie and her team here like i said they'll be monitoring the chat and the question uh, and answer box so fire away with any questions that you might have at all. We wanna answer those for you. Um, also, Andres from uh, Andres De La Mora from our business development team is here from California Coast Credit Union. He's here to answer any questions that you have in regards to our products and services. So if you're interested in um, having someone become a member or interested in any loans or deposit accounts, anything like that, uh, we can answer those questions for you today as well. Uh, so with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our uh, speaker for today. Uh, today we have Patrick Hicks from Trust and Will. He's the head of legal uh, for their organization. He's been there for, I believe, 10 years now, but been in the industry for a long time and uh, has done a, pre a few presentations for us now and does a really great job. So we're happy to have him here today. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Patrick. Thanks, Josh. Um, here's a large picture of me. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here and talk a little about estate planning today. I think it's a, a great topic and I'm really excited to share some information with you and hopefully we can take care of any questions along the way. Um, I'm grateful for CalCoast for putting this on. It's a, it's a fantastic uh, topic for people to learn about. And, and we at Trust and Will are really glad to be partnered with CalCoast in presenting this information. So today, our agenda today, we're gonna discuss the basics of estate planning. We're going to start with an understanding of what an estate plan is and what it does. We'll then move to cover some of the key documents that you might see in an estate plan and discuss how you might decide which of those documents are best for your needs. We'll then discuss who needs an estate plan and some of the most common reasons it might be time for you to think about creating or updating an estate plan and talk a little bit about how you might get started. We'll also leave some time at the end to go over any questions, but as Josh said, we do have some trust and will experts here with us ready to help with any questions along the way. If any questions come up, if there's anything you want to know more about, anything that's not clear to you, feel free to just ask a question in the Q&A panel. You should see Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. You might have to move your mouse for it to appear, but we have experts that are standing by ready to help along the way, but we will have time at the end to answer a few questions as well. So what is estate planning? Estate planning is essentially planning today for what happens tomorrow. At the most basic level, an estate plan lets you make decisions today about what should happen if you are unable to make decisions in the future. It's a set of instructions where you can say what you want to happen. And there might be lots of reasons you're unable to make a decision. The most common that you might think of is death. Obviously, you can't make decisions after your death, but it could also happen before death. Perhaps you're incapacitated or unable to communicate your decisions. There's some other reason that a decision needs to be made and you're not able to make that decision. And that's where estate planning comes in. It allows you to make decisions for what should happen in the event of one of those occurrences. So 
why should people care about estate planning? What motivates someone to create their estate plan? This is truly one of my favorite questions, and there are so many reasons to care. The biggest reason for most people is simply peace of mind. Having an estate plan gives you confidence that you have taken steps to protect yourself and your loved ones. You can rest easy knowing that you've put a plan in place and you've determined what should happen if things go wrong. But having a plan also avoids leaving your loved ones with no guidance during a difficult time. I've had many experiences with families who come to me after a death and say, we're just so grateful that he or she had a plan in place. It makes it so much easier knowing that we're doing the right thing. It's hard to overestimate the importance of not just your peace of mind, but the peace of mind that you can provide to your family in having to deal with a difficult situation and knowing that they have a playbook. You've told them what you want to happen and they know what to do to carry out your wishes. It is truly, truly important to both you and the surviving loved ones. But beyond peace of mind, another major motivating factor for many people, particularly parents, is nominating guardians to care for younger children and pets. This gives you confidence in knowing that your children will be in safe hands should the worst happen. But it's not just children, it's also pets. Pets, pets are family members to so many of these days, and pets can be a key piece of your estate plan. You can nominate a guardian or a caretaker to ensure that your pet is in safe hands should something happen to you. Guardians and caretakers typically apply after death. If, if you were to die, who will take care of your children? But they can also apply during lifetime. So if, you, if something happens and you're incapacitated or unable to care for your children, either temporarily or permanently, having a guardian nomination in place is the easiest way for you to be sure that your children and your pets will be cared for. That inca incapacity is also the third major motivator for people to look at estate planning. Studies show that the majority of Americans will be impacted by incapacity during their lifetime, either their own incapacity or the incapacity of a loved one or a family member. Advances in modern technology, medical miracles these days, they, they happen all the time. People are surviving longer and they are able to survive through conditions that they would not have been able to live through in the past. But that also means that there's an increased likelihood that someone may have diminished capacity or they're unable to make decisions, or they're unable to understand the consequences of their decisions. Having a plan in place can be critical to providing the desired outcome should that happen. Having a plan in place can also make it easier for your family to respect your wishes. Many people overlook the importance of incapacity planning, and it's not uncommon for people to think, oh, estate planning, that's what happens at my death. That's where assets go. But I've had many experience with those same people. They come into estate planning thinking, I'm having an estate plan, it's going to say what happens when I die, and it's going to say where my things go. But as they go through the process and they, and they start to think about these questions about what happens if I'm still alive but incapacitated, it's really, really common for those people to eventually turn, turn around and say, the most important thing for me, the thing that I got out of this process that mattered the most were these healthcare documents that plan for incapacity, because I now know that my decisions are known and my family knows what to do. And these are inherently personal decisions. There's no easy way to have a default rule match what you want for your needs. And there's no certainty that anyone else can make your decision the same way that you would. So having a plan in place to plan for incapacity is incredibly important and increasingly important each day and each year. But it's not just about incapacity planning either. Asset distributions are a key feature. A primary motivator for many people is the ability to control where your assets go at death. And you can choose to have assets benefit your family and loved ones. That's very common. But it's also common to have assets support charities and organizations and causes that were important to you during lifetime. These are some of the most impactful and powerful and sentimental gifts that someone could make. And I've, I've worked with clients who have dealt with the death and they have said, I, I, the thing that I cherished the most about you know, my parents' estate plan was writing a check to a charity and, and carrying out a distribution to, to an organization because that's who my father was. That's what mattered. And that's, that's my father's legacy. Sure, I got an inheritance and that matters to me and that helps me financially. But the, the mark that's left on this earth is that gift to a charity. So impacts to charities and causes and organizations should not be overlooked. But you can also use asset distributions as part of an estate plan to minimize taxes and maximize the benefits to your beneficiaries, either your families and your other individuals or to charities. 
many people do equate estate planning with asset distribution and, and obviously it does play a large part. But again, asset distributions are not the end all of estate planning. There are lots of other reasons that people should consider estate planning. And the last really common motivating reason to look at estate planning is business succession planning. This is often overlooked for individuals who own their own business. But business succession planning is critical to ensure that your business does not evaporate after death. Not having a plan in place can mean that the value of your business drops precipitously at your death. There can be no one who can step in to manage your business that can impact not only the value that's left to your beneficiaries, but it can impact the livelihood of your, your workers and your employees who depend on that business. So business succession planning is an incredibly important feature of estate planning. So we've got the whole down. Why is estate planning important? But what is an estate plan? Ultimately, an estate plan is a set of documents containing instructions for what should happen if you cannot speak for yourself. Typically, an estate plan includes multiple documents, not just one. And each of those documents will vary. Each of those documents is designed to do one specific thing. So the documents in your plan may not match the exact same documents as someone else's plans. Because those documents do one thing, we need to make sure that your plan has documents that all the things that are important to you. So your plan might focus on just one or two of those things and have just one or two of those documents, but someone else's plan might be more comprehensive with a full suite of five or six documents. So ultimately, it's not just one document and there's no single set of documents that is one size fits all. Every plan is individualized and customized and should match your needs and your situation. But the most typical documents that you will see in most estate plans are wills, trusts, and healthcare documents. Let's dive in a, a bit on each of those. What is a will? A will is the one document that most people have some knowledge of, some understanding, some familiarity. Sometimes it's uh, you've experienced the death of a family member and, you, and you've seen the process of the, their will being carried out. Some people just seen it on TV. There's, there's all these TV shows and movies and knives out and, and the, the great imagery of the lawyer opening the, the will and reading after death. And it, I, unfortunately, it doesn't always happen that way. It's not nearly that dramatic. The, the life of a lawyer is much, um, much, much more boring than it may be presented on TV. But most people have some understanding of what a will is. A will is a legal document that controls most assets when you die. And a will has three fundamental functions. And these are fundamental needs that everyone needs to account for in their estate plan. The first is assets. A will determines who gets what, where your assets go. And again, that can be to your family or a charity or to, to you know, friends and, and other people in your life that were important to you. But where your assets go is handled by a will. The second is children. A will nominates guardians for your children. And that's critically important if you have young children. If your children are already adults, they may not need guardians. They might in some situations. But if you have young children, it's th there's absolutely important that you have a will that nominates guardians to ensure that someone can care for those children if you are unable to do so. And lastly, a will specifies your final arrangements. These are your funeral instructions, your burial preferences. And we've, we see at Trust and Will, this is increasingly important for people. The, the memorial services and the instructions are where people spend a lot of time. And this is where your personality could come through because this is where you get to plan what you want your final events to be like. Is it a party? Do you want certain songs played? Do you want you know, religious uh, sentimentalities or do you want it to be uh, you know, a festive event? Do you want poetry readings or scripture readings? All of these things are again, inherently personal but these are important functions of a will. And those three functions, everyone needs those. those. Those are decisions that have to be made for everyone upon death. There's no option to just simply say, these decisions are not being made. So what happens if you don't have a will and those decisions aren't made by you? This is known as intestacy. And those functions of a will are essential. And so if you are in intestacy and you do not have a will, what happens is state law provides default assumptions that will step in and essentially fill in the gaps and make decisions for you. And so those decisions will still be made. They're just made by someone else. Maybe it's your state legislature. Maybe it's your state legislature 50 years ago, or maybe it's 
someone you've never met who's decided, here's what we think most people would want, even if it's not what you specifically want. In many cases, those default laws, those do provide you know, results that are good for most people or close enough, and, and they're not terrible in a lot of cases. But one of the most common misunderstandings that people have is that people will assume that these default laws will provide the same results that they would provide for themselves. That not having a plan gives you the same results that you would have if you did have a plan in place. And that's just not the case, unfortunately. And so even if you have a situation where it's simple, you want, you, you know, you pass away, you want everything to go to your spouse and your two young children, that's really common. And that is what most state default laws say. Even without a will, everything would go to your spouse and your two children. But there are some key differences, and it's not always the result that's intended. Instead of everything passing to your spouse to be used to care for your spouse and your two children, that might be what you have in a will. But those state default laws might say that instead, one third of the assets pass to your spouse and one third passes to each of your two young children. That's a little different. You might not want your two-year-old to have a one third ownership interest in your house. Maybe worse, you might not want your 16-year-old to have a one third ownership interest in your house. I, I can imagine how I was when I was 16 and having the threat of my mom of, I'm going to take my third of the interest in this house and, and, and do something else with it. It's, it's, it just may not be the right result that you would want for your situation. But it's important to recognize that those default laws fill in the gaps, but they don't always fill in the gaps the way you want them filled in. So that's why it's so important that everyone have a will. Every adult should have a will. Every individual over the age of 18 should have a will. What happens after you die? How does a will really work? Wills go through a process known as probate. Most people have heard of probate. It is a judicial process. It's run through the court. Typically, the court's known as probate court. But the process will essentially determine the validity of the will and appoint an executor. The, the process starts by essentially saying, does this will meet all of the legal requirements? Is it written? Is it signed? Are there two witnesses? Does it, does it have the requisite intent? You know, all, all the things that are required to make a valid will, probate just essentially looks and checks the box and says, yep, this meets all of those requirements, it's a valid will. And once the will is determined to be valid, it then appoints the executor. Typically the executor is named in your will. And the court would say, okay, now that executor is appointed and they are now in charge of the administration of this will. In the role of the executor, they're, they're very much a manager or a CEO. They are in charge of the administration of the will. And they have three primary duties. They collect assets, they pay debts, expenses, and taxes, and then they distribute remaining assets to your beneficiaries. So they collect assets, they pay fees, and then they pay out assets, in, pay, out. It's fairly simple, fairly direct. Unfortunately, simple and direct is not how you would typically describe probate. Probate, um, in one word, is bad in most cases. Uh, at the very least, it's undesirable for almost everyone. And, and it can vary. Some cases are less bad. Some cases are really bad. It's, I'm not sure I've ever heard anyone say it's good, but it's, it's different degrees of bad, if you will. But it can be slow. Um, here in California, it's typically 12 to 18 months from start to end for probate. An important note, that was before the backlog in the courts caused by COVID and the pandemic and the shutdowns. Since we're now in a process of having an accumulated year of cases that we're working through, you might expect 24 to even 36 months from start to finish. So that's two to three years from the moment of death until this probate process is finally wrapped up and all the assets are paid out and it's all completed. That is a very long, long period. But beyond the time, Probate can be difficult and stressful. Probate begins immediately after the death, and that is during a period of grieving a loss. And that's, that's tough. There's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of stress already. But adding to that a judicial process and, and, and all that it brings with it, that often brings out a lot of resentment, and that can lead to disputes. It's not uncommon for just the fact that you have to go through probate to be that last straw that triggers a dispute. And now you have a dispute in your family. Maybe there's litigation and everything just spirals out of control. Probate's also really expensive in many cases. Uh, the fees tend to vary, at least in California, it, it's roughly scales with the size of your estate. A larger estate 
pays larger fees, a smaller state, smaller fees. There's a complex formula, but you know, as, as a quick guideline, a million dollar estate in California can cost about $50,000 of fees for the executor and attorneys through probate. That $50,000 can, can be a big hit. But it's also important to note that that million dollars might not be as lofty as it seems. That can be the value of your house. Even if it's mortgaged, it's the full value of your house. I saw the number the other day, the average uh, property price in San Diego County is $825,000. So if you imagine that an individual who buys an $825,000 house today, they may not have a lot of money in the bank because their mortgage is probably gonna be quite high, but their estate will be at least $825,000. They add in just a little bit more, they're at that million dollars, they suddenly have a $50,000 fee to pay. They may not have $50,000 cash. They may have to take out a second mortgage. They may have to sell their house. It's, it's a terrible result, but it's not uncommon for someone to either have to incur debt or even sell assets for the privilege of going through probate. I can't stress enough how bad probate can be. Not always bad, but it can be incredibly bad and it is common for it to be incredibly bad. So, the fact that it's so bad leads to a very simple conclusion. How do you avoid it? Pro avoidance is an incredibly impactful motivator for a lot of people. And that is one of, the many, one of the reasons that many people will look to a trust. A trust avoids probate. But what is a trust? Without getting too much into the legal complexities, a trust is a legal agreement between three parties. There's a settlor who might be known as a trustor or a grantor. This is the person who creates the trust and they put their property into it. There's a trustee. This is the person who holds and manages the assets of the trust. And then there's the beneficiary. This is who the trust is in favor of. So basically the settlor creates the trust. They give the assets to the trustee to hold for the beneficiary. Settlor, trustee, beneficiary. If you're a very visual person, some people think of triangles, but there's a three person relationship. In most cases, that settlor and the trustee and the beneficiary, they're all the same person initially. So I take my assets, I create a trust, I name myself as trustee, I hold my own assets for my own benefit. It's basically I'm moving things from my left pocket to my right pocket. I still have total control. But over time, those roles can split and change. So after my death, someone else will become trustee and maybe my children would become beneficiaries and my, my spouse might become the trustee. So it's important to note that while they may all start as the same person, they typically don't end as the same person. But the key benefit for most people of a trust, the purpose of a trust, the reason most people look for a trust is simply to avoid probate. A trust is an easy way to avoid all of those negative consequences of probate. A trust skips probate. It just, no, no assets in a trust have to go through probate. It is as simple as that. All of those bad things that we discussed about a will and probate, a trust just bypasses them. But a trust is not just about probate avoidance. That is a major, major benefit, but it's not the only benefit. A trust allows you to have more control over when and how assets are distributed. This is incredibly important for many people. I have young children. I may not want my young children to receive an immediate distribution of my assets. I may want my assets to pay to my young children when they're 18 or 25, or maybe some at 30 and some at 40. There's, there's a lot that you can do. Maybe I even wanna say, I wanna give 20% distribution upon graduation from college. There's a lot you can do with a trust to say when and how assets are distributed. A trust also applies during lifetime and after death. A will, you create it during lifetime, but it only functions at death. The, the moment of death is when a will starts to have meaning. But a trust can have meaning as soon as it's signed. But this means a trust can be useful in planning for incapacity. And a trust can ensure that there is a seamless transition of control. If something were to happen to me and I have a trust in place, I may not, may not be able to make my own decisions, but my successor trustee can step in and immediately make decisions on my behalf without skipping a beat. That's a huge, huge benefit for anyone who's focused or concerned about incapacity planning. Additionally, a trust allows you to provide for your family. This is this is something that relates to that control over asset distributions, but it's a big motivator for people with young children and blended families. 
it gives you more control over when and how assets are distributed to younger children, but it also lets you do a little bit more than a will. And a great simple example might be a blended family or a second marriage. Maybe I'm, I'm married, I have my own kids and my, I'm married to my spouse and she has her own kids. And I may want my assets to go to my spouse after my death and take care of her. But then I wanna make sure that my kids are protected. So I wanna I want take care of my spouse and then I wanna take care of my kids. You can do that with a trust. You can set it up so that on my death, my spouse is taken care of, but then on my spouse's death, my children are taken care of. You can do that with the trust. With the will, you can give assets to your spouse, but that's that's it. You, you don't have any say over what happens once their assets are in your spouse's hand. So if you have family needs, a blended family, young children, or complex family dynamics, a trust really helps you plan for those as well. A trust can also help you minimize taxes, and that can be both income taxes and estate taxes. Currently, the federal state tax threshold is, is very high. Uh, most people are not going to be impacted. It's over $11 million, and it's increasing each year. There's rumors, there's threats, there's talk about maybe lowering that exemption amount, so it could become more relevant in the future. I, maybe in the near future, maybe not. But for most people right now, estate tax on the federal level, it's not a major concern. But a trust can be a useful tool if you have a more significant asset composition or if those thresholds do change and the estate tax is uh, more, of a, more of a concern. So it's important to note that it can be used for planning for taxes. With a will, the manager of the will was the executor who was appointed during probate. They were the person in charge of administering the will. With the trust, it's the trustee. Again, the trustee is the person who holds and manages the assets in that three-part relationship. I give my assets to the trustee to hold and manage. The trustee is like the CEO of the trust. The trustee is essentially bound by law. Every state has law that says what the trustee can and cannot do. But the terms of the trust also provide specific instructions. So the trustee has to comply with both state law and the terms of the trust. But the trustee is still plays a critically important role. And there are a lot of the decisions that the trustee makes using the trustee's own discretion. Maybe there's a choice of, I can do A or I can do B, and the trustee will make the decision of whether you do A or do B. So it's important to think that a trustee is someone that you trust to make those decisions for you. And it's also to be someone that's important to think that they have the ability to carry out those duties. There's a lot of record keeping involved. There may be some difficult decisions about financial management, things like that. So you need to make sure that you have someone with the ability and know how to carry out those duties. The trustee can work with other professionals. They can hire a lawyer. They can hire accountants or tax advisors. They can hire financial advisors. They don't have to do it all themselves, but they at least need to be able to work with those professionals. Common choices for trustees, the most common is your spouse, then your children, then other relatives, and then lastly, close friends. You sometimes see business partners. Um, there are professional trustees. There are either bank-like companies or individuals who, for a fee, will serve as a trustee. That is, that is their profession. That is what they do. Those are great choices as professional trustees, are great choices for some, particularly in complex situations. But most people still use a family member as their trustee. But again, it's important to think about what the role of the trustee is and ensure that your family member is equipped to handle that role. When we talk about trusts, um, it's important to note that there are many types of trusts. Um, a trust, while, while there's essentially one type of will and all, almost all wills handle the same purposes, there are many different types of trusts. And some types of trusts do have very distinct differences. What we've been discussing is a revocable living trust. This is the most commonly used type of trust. When most people think of a trust, they think of a revocable living trust. The revocable part just means it can be changed or revoked or amended during lifetime. The living part just means it's created during lifetime. And a revocable living trust, it does avoid probate. So when most people create an estate plan and they put a trust in place, nine times out of 10, probably 95 times out of 100, maybe even higher, the trust that they're using is a revocable living trust. There are other types of trust. For example, a testamentary trust is less common, but it does exist. Whereas a living trust, a revocable living trust is created during lifetime, a testamentary trust is only created at death. Essentially, your will includes a provision that creates a trust when you die. This makes it easier to create, but because it's created under a will, you still have to go through probate. 
So it's a bit of a give and take. Yes, it might be a little bit easier now, but then you're making it a little bit harder for your family later on if you have to go through probate. But a testamentary trust is an option and it, some people choose a testamentary trust for their needs. There are some other types of trusts that you might encounter if you're looking at research, if you have questions. Uh, just a few examples. There are some trusts that are used for tax planning. Some examples of some terms you might hear are credit shelter trust or Q-tip marital trust, things like that. Those are typically types of trust or even structures of trust, how trusts are designed to work on the more technical side. And they're typically used for minimizing taxes or, or shifting from estate taxes into income taxes, things like that. Very tax motivated decisions. There are also things like an irrevocable life insurance trust or an islet. You'll sometimes hear a bunch of acronyms of grats and <laughs> slats and, and crats and cruts, and you have to make sure that you never combine those two and get the wrong acronym out of those. But um, those, those are other acronym types of trusts that are typically used for primarily tax functions, but they do have some other benefits like maybe supporting a charity in a tax advantaged way. These are less common and they're specifically for intended purposes, defined uses. And then lastly, there are other types of trusts that are not necessarily tax planning trusts, but have other defined benefits. A most, the most common one is a special needs trust. A special needs trust would be a type of trust that would allow a beneficiary to receive an inheritance without losing their qualification or eligibility to receive governmental assistance. So if you have an individual who has additional needs and, and is receiving governmental support, a special needs trust is a great way to ensure that you can provide assets to that beneficiary without jeopardizing their ability to continue to receive governmental support. And there are some other types as well. Asset protection trusts to help ensure that your, your assets are, are shielded from potential liabilities or lawsuits. And even things like Medicaid planning trusts, if you're looking at maybe qualifying for, for healthcare assistance uh, later in life. Th those are trusts that, again, have very specific uses and may be a piece of an estate plan. But when most people think of trust and estate planning, they're thinking of a revocable living trust. We mentioned these mostly just so that you know that there are other types of trust in your situation. You may wanna look at a different type for a very specific need, but typically these trusts are in addition to a revocable living trust and not in place of. So what's the difference between a trust and a will? This is, I, I, I think this is probably the most common question we get at trust and will. And, I, most people have had this question at some point in time, and it's a great question. There's a lot that trust and wills share, but there are some key differences. They have some similarities and they have some differences. They're not true alternatives. When you're thinking about, do I need a trust or do I need a will? It's not really the right way to think about it. They, they each do different things. So things they do in common, both the trust and will dispose of assets. And it's simple, that's a great benefit for most people. But the differences really also start to, to have an impact. Trust avoid probate and wills go through probate. That's a huge dif difference in and of itself. For many people, that is a reason enough to look at a trust. Trusts also give you greater control over when and how assets are distribu distributed. Again, if you have younger children or a blended family, that might be a reason that you look at a trust instead of just looking at a will. Wills can be a little easier to set up. Trust can require a little more work. Signing the documents is about the same, but with the trust, you need to make sure that your assets are actually put into the trust. You have to transfer assets to the trust, known as trust funding. So you have to do a little bit more work after you actually sign the documents to ensure that the trust owns the assets. So that's a little bit more work for the trust, but that's what allows the trust to bypass probate. So it's a little more work now, but it saves a lot of work later. But that's the difference between a will and a trust. A will is a little easier to set up. A trust requires a little bit more work right now. And wills allow you to nominate guardians and specify final arrangements. A trust does not. That's something that's only handled in a will. You can have a trust, but it does not nominate guardians and it does not specify final arrangements. Because each of these documents do something different, typically you'll see that a trust is paired with a will as a set. You may have just a will or you may have a will and a trust. So instead of thinking, do I need a will or do I need a trust? A better way to think about it might be that everybody needs a will. Every adult needs a will. Some adults also need a trust. So if you think about it that way, you start from the perspective of everybody needs a will. Then you start to think, well, when do I need to add a trust? Why might I wanna consider a trust? And one of the reasons you might wanna consider a trust is younger children. 
we've talked about this a little bit, but rather than having all of your assets go to your kids immediately or having it paid out when they turn 18 even, a trust lets you set triggers for asset distributions. And you can choose any of these triggers that you want in your trust. The most common is ages. So you could say, I want my assets to be distributed at age 35 and age 45. But it doesn't have to be ages. It can be life events. It can be graduating college or getting married or having kids, things like that. Not only does this help you stretch out distributions and ensure that, that these assets will be available throughout lifetime, it also helps you um, maybe mitigate some of the risks of a young, immature beneficiary blowing their assets. I, I mean, there's, there's all, all the horror stories about an 18-year-old receiving an assets and deciding, I don't need to go to college. I look at all this money I have. And then two years later, they've blown through all the assets and now they're um, in a much worse situation financially and developmentally than they would have been otherwise. So younger children is a great way to look at a trust just based off the additional benefits you have over asset distributions. And again, complex family dynamics, both blended families and second marriages. A trust can let you protect and benefit your spouse for your spouse's lifetime, but still ensure that your assets go to your kids. The fear that a lot of people have is that I'm going to leave assets to my spouse and then my spouse is going to spend all of them on her kids and my children will be left out in the cold. Another concern that some people have is my spouse is going to get remarried and spend all of that money on her new husband or they're going to go a cruise around the world and you know there's pros and cons maybe you, maybe that's a, a concern that you have and maybe it's not but if it is a concern you have a trust can let you address that you can put essentially tie some restrictions onto what your spouse can do to ensure that your spouse's needs are met but your children are still protected trusts also provide some benefits in terms of privacy wills become public after death the probate process is a judicial process. You can go to the court today and sit in and watch probate. I wouldn't recommend it. It's pretty boring, but you could do it. And you can actually go down to the courthouse and get a copy of somebody's will and read everything in it. Again, typically pretty boring. And most people aren't going to go through that process, but you could. And the fact that you could means that a will has less privacy. Trusts do not go through probate. There's no option for anyone to go and request a copy of a trust unless they are interested in the trust. They're a beneficiary, for example. But a third party, a stranger, has no ability to access any of the information in a trust. So a trust provides more privacy than a will. And higher asset levels are also another reason that you might want to consider looking at a trust. Um, beyond probate avoidance, um, there's also a state and income tax minimization. Both of those are relevant. Probate avoidance, again, typically you're the probate fees will scale up as the asset values increase. So as your asset levels are higher, your fees of probate will be higher. It makes it more of an incentive to avoid probate. In a state income tax minimization, again, over $11 million thresholds today on the federal state tax. It's less of an impact for most people, but some people it's an impact and that could change in the future. So it's always something to bear in mind that a trust can be useful for that. But a trust also gives you opportunities for more advanced planning. We talked a little bit about charitable donations and all those acronym trusts. Those are great options for you to look at if you want to support a charity after your death, or even if you want to support a charity now, but continue to receive a stream of income for the rest of your life. There are lots of things you can do with the trust. So if you have a, maybe a, a more specific desire, a trust typically is, um, it provides more flexibility and, and more control over what you can do. So that might be a reason you would look at a trust over a will. So we, we mentioned early that there are three primary estate planning documents that are a part of most or all estate plans. It's the will and the trust. And then the third is healthcare documents. Um, healthcare documents is not just a single document, it's a set of documents. And the, the, the individual documents can vary, but the, the most common documents you will see are a power of attorney, a living will, which is sometimes known as a healthcare directive, and a HIPAA authorization. And we can quickly talk about each of those. A power of attorney is a document that allows you to designate someone else to make financial and non-medical decisions for you. Typically, this applies during the event of incapacity, but it can be set up in various ways. So a common example would be, you know, I, I step off the curb and I get hit by that proverbial bus. I'm unconscious. I'm unable to make decisions, but I have a power of attorney in place. The agent named in my power of attorney can act on my behalf. They can go to the bank, they can deposit checks. If I own a business, they can pay payroll. Um, we're a couple of days late, but they could have filed my tax returns for me. Anything like that that's important 
my agent can do on my behalf. A living will or the healthcare directive is very similar, but it deals exclusively with medical and healthcare decisions. So the power of attorney is financial and non-medical and the living will or healthcare directive is medical. Um, I, I like to note that the living will is maybe one of the most confusing names because it has absolutely nothing to do with the will that we spent so much time talking about. It is a healthcare document and never understood why someone decided to call it a living will. It's confusing. So healthcare directive might actually be a better way to keep it straight. There's last will and testament, which is what most people think of as a will. And then there's your healthcare directive. The healthcare directive lets you specify your own medical preferences in advance. You can say what you want to happen. And that can include anything from allowing certain treatments or do you want to receive life support or not receive life support? Do you want to receive artificial nutrition and hydration or not? Those kind of large major decisions you can make in advance. But a healthcare directive also lets you designate someone else who can make additional decisions for you. And that helps again, fill in those gaps. So maybe it's clear that you do want life support when possible, but maybe you need to know what, what other types of treatment, how aggressive do you wanna be? Do you wanna pursue experimental therapy or not? Maybe that's not something that's specifically addressed in your healthcare directive, but that's where your healthcare agent comes in. Your healthcare agent is able to make those decisions on your behalf. Essentially, they step into your shoes and when your doctor needs to get informed medical consent from you, they can instead get that informed medical consent from your healthcare agent. It's important to note that your healthcare directive will always apply while you are incapacitated. That's when it's most important to have those documents. When I can't make decisions for myself, I need someone else to speak for me and I need a document that says what decisions I want made. So your healthcare directive will always continue throughout a period of incapacity. The last of the healthcare documents is a HIPAA authorization. Um, many people overlook this document and it's a relatively small document, but it's very important. HIPAA is a federal law, you may have heard of it, and it essentially protects your healthcare and medical information. It provides privacy. It says that your doctors and healthcare providers can't go out and you know, chat about your healthcare conditions and your, and your medical treatments after work over a beer. So your doctor's prohibited from talking about your care with anyone other than you. But with your healthcare directive, your doctor needs to be able to speak with your healthcare agent so that your healthcare agent can make decisions for you. And in some other situations, your doctor might need to speak with your agent under your power of attorney or even your trustee so that you can coordinate on things like paying for healthcare decisions and making determinations about should you be moved into you know, in-facility treatment or stay at home. So the HIPAA authorization essentially ensures that your designated agents and representatives can speak with your doctors and medical providers about decisions, considering cost of treatments and things like that. It's frequently overlooked and it essentially just allows the doctors to communicate with the people that they need to communicate with. It's a simple document, but it's an important one to have in your state plan. So who needs an estate plan? Every adult needs an estate plan. It's as simple as that. If you're over age 18, you need an estate plan. You know, we, we've discussed that your estate plan might vary. Some, some adults need a will, some might need a trust, some need both. Uh, some people, almost everyone needs a will, almost everyone needs the healthcare documents, some people need a trust. Um, the common reasons that many people start to think about creating a state plan are marriage, children, um, starting to accumulate assets when it starts to think, hmm, I need to start thinking about what happens to these. Um, if you have medical concerns, that's a, a, a motivating factor for many people to start looking at it, putting the other state plan, typically focused on those healthcare documents. Uh, and lastly, unfortunately, is dealing with someone else's death. Um, hopefully that they've had an estate plan in place, but with or without an estate plan, having gone through the process of dealing with the death is a common reason that many people start to think about, well, what do I need to plan for my own mortality? But it's also important to realize that your plan should evolve as your life does. Estate planning is not a single once in a lifetime event. Your estate plan should evolve over time. Your life is different now than it was 15 years ago, and it will probably be different in 15 years from now. Your estate plan should be as well. So what are some common reasons you might want to look at updating your estate plan? A trust and will, we like to break it down fairly simply. Births, deaths, changes in marital status, and passage of time. So every three to five years, even if you haven't had any births, deaths, or changes in marital status. 
that just ensures that your documents stay up to date with any changes, both in your life and in the laws. Um, it's not uncommon to see a law change every two to three years, and it might just be a good time for you to update your plan every three to five years just to make sure that you're not planning for a situation that the laws have changed and then you're kind of caught out in the cold and your documents don't do what you want them to do. So you should update your plan every three to five years or sooner if there are births, deaths, or changes in marital status. And additionally, as your children become adults, they need their own plans. While your child is under 18, you have parental rights. You can step in and speak on behalf of your young children. But once your child turns 18, that essentially ends. They need to have legal documents in place to let you act on their behalf. So as your children get older, not only is it an important time for you to think about, do you need to update your estate plan? It's an important time to start having a conversation with your children about the importance of them having their own estate plan. An 18-year-old, they need a will and they need healthcare directives. And their plan may be very simple, but it's important to have it in place. So how do you go about having an estate plan created? Um, I used to be an estate planning attorney who met with clients in a, you know, a law office downtown. And that's an option. It, it works for a lot of people and it's worked that way for a lot of years. It's not an option for everyone, but it is still an option. But there are other technology-based options like trust and will. Um, we've created a system to offer estate planning that's easier, faster, and more affordable than ever been available before. Um, our documents and products really cover 95% of the population. Um, we've kind of covered what an estate plan is and how you, why it's important, but how you go about getting one is the last kind of step. And that's, that's really where a lot of people want to go from here is, okay, we, we all understand I, I need an estate plan, but what do I do? How do I get one? So yeah, go find an attorney. You can, you can call your bar. You can, you know, look one up in the phone book or search online. Um, I, it's tough. It's tough to find an attorney that you can trust and you, it's tough to compare rates, but it, it's an option. You know, otherwise you can always look at trust and will either for creating your state plan or even just for information. We have, you know, built out a fairly complex learning center and we have member support representatives standing by who can answer questions about you. So, you know, whether you're looking to start a pl state plan or just learn a little bit more, trust and will is a fantastic resource for that. Um, but trust and will, we were kind of born from the recognition that the traditional way of creating a state plan wasn't working for everyone. That process was expensive, confusing, and intimidating. Many people had no plan in place or just had plans that were outdated. So we took a new approach and we've embraced technology and we've developed an easy and affordable way to create high quality, and fully customized documents that are on par with those that you would get from an attorney. In many ways, we're like TurboTax for estate planning. And, and that, that resonates with a lot of people. It's easy. It's one question at a time you go through and you're done before you know it. But at the end, you get high quality documents that are, again, are very much like those you would get from a lawyer. We offer three different product uh, tiers, each designed to handle a range of situations, ranging everything from the most basic needs for new parents, all the way to complex trust with very sophisticated tax mechanisms for high asset levels. Our guardian product is really focused on new parents who are looking to plan for their children. Uh, it's typically an entry point for younger individuals who are just looking to set up an estate plan to say, what happens to my kids? Our will plan is our standard plan to cover a wide range of needs. This includes both the will and that full set of healthcare documents. And then our trust plan is our more, most comprehensive plan. On top of the will and healthcare documents, that also adds that revocable living trust. And that helps you ensure that you have both probate avoidance and the additional benefits of a trust like planning for younger children and minimizing taxes. And again, that trust plan includes the will, the trust, and the healthcare plan. And importantly, we also offer a plan to receive individual review, guidance, and advice from a licensed estate planning attorney. So even though you may want to use technology to make the process easier, maybe you still have some questions and you want the additional peace of mind. I want to talk with an expert. I, I want an attorney to give me specific advice about my situation. We make that happen through Trust and Will. You can you know, log into your account, connect with your attorney, and speak um, with your attorney. Um, we, we offer that. It's $200 for a year of access to the attorneys. So that's, that's a great option for a lot of people who may feel comfortable kind of creating their own plan, but still have a little questions, a few questions along the way. And again, even if you just want to learn more about estate planning to figure out what's the best fit for you, you can always head to trustandwill.com. You know, we offer great wealth of resources. So does Cal Coast. They're, the resources and information that you have available, you should take advantage of those because you should educate yourself so that you feel empowered to make the decisions about what's best for you. If you do go to Trust and Will, you can look for the learn link at the top of the page. 
Again, we have a wealth of information about estate planning, what you need to know, how to decide what's best for you, how to get started with your plan. And we have helpful chat representatives who are available. Um, they've been available in this presentation, but they can also help with any questions that you have. There's a chat link there, but they're, they're very friendly and respond um, almost immediately, almost all the time. I don't know how they ever sleep. So, but you should definitely take advantage of those as well. So again, Trust and Will, CalCoast, fantastic resources for you to learn a little bit more and then take that next step of take the knowledge that you've gained and actually convert that into having a plan put in place. Um, I think we have a few questions. I'm gonna stop screen sharing so that I can take a look at these questions, but um, we can we can take these. And then Josh, I think you might have a little bit to add about um, where, where individuals can go to CalCoast to get a little more information and, and share a link as well. Thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, a ton of great info as always. Yeah, we have uh, the link has been put into the chat a few times to, that goes to our website um, where you can find more info, but I'll, I'll make sure to include that one more time. And uh, we do have some questions, I believe, Patrick, for you. Uh, are, if you're able to pull those up, uh, let's jump right into that. Perfect. So the first question I'm thinking is uh, the pros and cons of a restatement versus an amendment of a trust. It's a great question. Um, just, just kind of background, a trust restatement is a it's a legal term that it essentially means uh, an amendment, but it's a 100% amendment. You, you take everything out and put entirely new text in. Um, an amendment to, might be a, a less than 100% amendment. Maybe you just wanna change your, your trustees. And so you could change just, just one section of the trust. So a restatement versus an amendment, um, a restatement is typically used when you wanna just say, hey, it's been you know five years, I just wanna have kind of delete everything and start in with new provisions to make sure that they're always up to date. An amendment might be used in the interim if you've had, for example, a, a birth or a death and you just want to add in a new child into your trust. So if it's a bigger change, you typically would use a restatement. An amendment might be just for a smaller change. Um, second question, mother's house is in the name of a trust. She passed away 15 years ago and left the house to me, but it was never transferred to my name and I missed the parent to child period. I wanna create my own trust. I'm 75 years old and I don't wanna lose Prop 13 tax advantage. Oh, that's a great question. Unfortunately, that happens um, quite often that after a death, the things that might happen don't always happen exactly in the order and the time that they should. Um, this, is, this is a difficult situation because there are a lot of specific facts that aren't known in this question. Um, what I can say is, well, most people don't always think of calling the, the tax collector as an enjoyable experience. The, my experience is that the information they can provide, they can't give you legal advice, but they can, they can be incredibly helpful in pointing you in direction of either resources they have on their website or in their office or connecting you with information that can help you fill out the forms and explain what you can do to essentially retroactively claim some of those credits or, or um, issues that you you might have overlooked. So I, I would say start by calling your your county tax tax collector and see what information they can connect you with to help you get that resolved. Uh, another question, can I start out with a handwritten will and is it considered legal or should it go through a lawyer? That's a great question. Some states do recognize a handwritten will as long as it meets certain requirements. Um, not all states do, importantly, but some states do. The The key detail is that that handwritten will still must meet those legal requirements. And unfortunately, it's not uncommon for a handwritten will to miss one of those requirements and be invalid. But even beyond that, sometimes it's not just knowing that you can say it, it's knowing how to say it. And so a handwritten will can work in some cases, but there's a greater risk that something is omitted or said incompletely, or there's some sort of internal inconsistency that causes some sort of confusion or dispute. So um, it can be done, but at least from trust and will's perspective, in terms of creating your own will, sometimes it's easier to start with maybe more of a templated approach of go through like a TurboTax and have a document that has been created and designed by lawyers, but actually completed by you. So yes, you can create a handwritten will in most cases, I'm not sure most attorneys would recommend it. And there might be an easier comparable solution through something like trust and will if you're looking for an easier option. I have a mortgage. How are the mortgage utilities paid while going through the process of working through the trust upon death? I've grown children who have their own mortgages cannot afford to pay an additional mortgage. Oh, that's a great question as well. Um, so uh, two points to raise here. 
first, the fact that you have a mortgage does not mean that you can't put your house into a trust, for example. There's, there's federal law that generally says you can still put a house into a trust, even if it has a mortgage. As always, there's some exceptions, but generally that's the rule. But in terms of after death, the mortgage doesn't expire at death. The mortgage is still associated with the house. So all of those mortgage payments will continue to be due. And your trustee would be responsible for paying those from trust assets. Your trustee does not have to incur personal obligation. They don't have to use their own money, but anything that's in the trust, whether it's, it's bank accounts or your stock portfolio or your, your retirement accounts that may pay to, into the trust at death, any of those assets that are under the trustee's management can be used to pay those mortgage bills and utility bills and other expenses. Ultimately, once that house is distributed out of the trust to a beneficiary, for example, your spouse or your children, that recipient would be responsible for continuing to make those payments. Typically, they can just take over your mortgage. They don't have to go out and get a new mortgage. Again, some exceptions to that rule, but in most cases, a family member can just take over your mortgage payments. So that may be helpful if you have a better rate than they could have qualified for. But they can also go out and take out an additional mortgage or refinance or get a second mortgage if they need to, you know, lower their mortgage payment, stretch it over 30 additional years as well. Um, and the lastly, they can they can always sell that house if, if they don't have the ability to make those payments, they can always sell that house, uh, take the proceeds instead and maybe purchase a house that's more in line with their their financial portfolio. Uh, does a trust live forever and when does a trust end? Oh, that's a great question. Most trusts have designated endpoints, and they typically would be, um, an example might be that I have assets that pass in, into a trust for my child until my child reaches age 30, and then the trust ends and everything is paid out to my child directly. So typically there's some sort of triggering event. It can be age, it can be passage of time. There, there's lots of different reasons that a trust can end, but most trusts do have an end date. Um, it's possible to create a trust that lasts forever. It's not always a great option. There can be some tax consequences. Um, you can essentially opt into paying some additional taxes by not having an end date, but it's something that you can do if you really desire to, but most people don't want a perpetual trust, um, even though it may seem a, a nice option. Can an LLC be placed in a trust if it's the same owners? Yes, a trust can definitely hold an LLC or, or you know, almost, almost any type of assets. There are um, some restrictions on partnerships, but most revocable living trusts can even hold partnership assets. So if you own a business, um, an LLC, a corporation, a partnership, and anything like that, generally it can be placed into your trust. Um, your business can have specific rules. There might be in the, in the operating agreement for the LLC, might have a restriction, but that's less common. Most operating agreements, even if they have a restriction, will allow you to place your interest into a trust because trusts are so commonly used in estate planning. So yes, you can, but you should always check the specific rules for your business in your situation. Uh, Josh, I think there's one to you about the uh, CalCoS benefit to creating a trust. If I'm the ultimate beneficiary of my partner's assets, can you still use yeah, I think so. I mean, we can definitely go through, trust and wills definitely allowing you to, to create that. If you're a, a CalCo's member and your partner's not, and you're working with your partner and setting up a trust, that's definitely something that, that, that you can do. So, um, and, and again, if you have more information about that, you can always go to, to trustandwill.com and, and the Learn Center and learn a little more about how that might work. But that's, that's definitely something that can, can be handled um, through trust and will. I think, um, I think the trust and will of experts is beating me to the punch. There's, they've been knocking all these questions out before I can get to them. Yeah, there's been a lot of questions. I think we've had like over 60 questions or something like that in total. It's been uh, hot and heavy, which is great. Uh, a lot of interaction, a lot of engagement. Uh, it's just, there's just so much that can go into estate planning. It's amazing. I, I still learn something every time we do this. So, uh, but there was one question I wanted to go back to Patrick also, maybe it's the last question that we answer here. Uh, what or where do you look for an executor? I have no children and all my siblings are deceased. Anyone I name as an executor family-wise will need assistance getting through my trust, real estate sale, and financial assets. Yeah, so that's a that's a tough situation. Um, this, you know, with the with the trustee or an executor, the trustee of the will or the executor of the sorry, the trustee of the trust or the executor of the will, they're both that fiduciary role where they're managing uh, essentially the administration process. Um, 
if you don't have a family member or a close family friend or, or someone that you would trust to put in that role, you, you can name a professional. You can look for professional fiduciaries or professional executors. There are individuals who, you know, the same way that you could hire, you know, a, a, a landscaper who has a, a schedule of fees, but they, they're trained and they're qualified to serve as an, as an executor. And so they're, they're skilled in that area. You can, you can hire someone to fill that role. They typically do charge a fee, which is something to consider. If you, if you just don't nominate anyone, that's where you get in a situation where that state default law will fill in the gap and someone will be appointed to serve. And if no one fills that role from your family, maybe the court will just appoint, you know, a, a, a willing lawyer who will do it for a, a fixed established fee, some, something along those lines. So um, look around, see if you can find out if you can't find a family member, maybe a, a close friend that would be willing to serve. And if not, check out a professional fiduciary is, is certainly an option to consider. All right. Thank you again, Patrick, for presenting today, for answering all your all the questions. And thank you to the rest of your team as well for being available. Again, we had a lot of great engagement. If you do want to learn more, you can always visit the website link that's in the chat. I'll place it there one more time for you. Also, just a heads up that uh, if you didn't hear, this uh, session will be available on our YouTube channel. We'll have a recording of this so you can go back and take a look in case you'd like to get any of the information again. Uh, but for now, we're a little over time, so I'm going to wrap it up. I want to thank Patrick again uh, for being here, and um, we'll uh, see you next month for our next webinar. But until then, take care and be safe out there, stay healthy, and have a great day. Thank you.